Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Deconstructing Systemic Racism in the Public Service. My name is Margo Hurlberts and I'm a professor at Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, a Canada Research Chair and a member of Johnson Shoyama's Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I'm pleased to moderate today's event. The Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, or JSGS, is a national hub for advanced study and research in public policy administration. We're a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan that was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines Saskatchewan. Since our inception in 2007, we have swiftly become one of Canada's leading policy schools for educating graduate students and public servants interested in and devoted to advancing public value. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, JSGS physical homes are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. In addition to these territories, today's speakers are joining us from the traditional and unceded territories of the Tayoqua First Nations presented Klyokat, the territory covered by Treaty 13, which is traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabek, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. And you can see that I'm not always getting my pronunciations correctly, sorry for that. And what is now known as Broward County, whose original stewards are the Taino, Tequesta, Mikosaki, and Seminole. We are glad to welcome those of you joining us today from across Turtle Island and make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. For those of you new to the EDI discussion series, I'm pleased to welcome you today. This series focuses on engaging current and future public servants on issues pertaining to equity, diversity, and inclusion in the public sector. This series is proudly supported by the Max Bell Foundation, who encouraged the development of forward-looking innovations that impact public policies and practices. If you'd like more information on the Max Bell Foundation and their work, please click click the link that Karen will put in the chat. Today's discussion will focus on current struggles faced by BIPOC civil servants and how governments and public sector organizations can identify, disrupt, and dismantle systemic racism to build capacity. Our speakers will be sharing personal experiences and the topics being discussed may trigger or re-stimulate trauma to those attending today's events. We recognize the need for safety measures to minimize the risk associated with triggering. If you are experiencing distress as a result of this presentation, please look in the Zoom chat for a list of resources. So to help our event run smoothly, we ask all attendees stay muted and turn off their video during the presentation portion of our event. Please feel free to turn your videos back on for the Q&A. The format for today's event is as follows. Each of the presenters will present for approximately 10 minutes each. And following this, I have a series of questions I will pose to our panelists to continue the conversation. This will give you, our audience, time to come up with questions for our panelists, as following this would like to open it up to audience Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, please use Zoom's chat function to send your questions to myself, Margo Hurlbert, and I'll read out your question and feel free to submit questions at any time during today's event. If you have logistical questions during today's event, please don't hesitate to send a message to Karen Jaster LaForge via Zoom's chat and her email is at jsgs.events at uregina.ca. So you can find her contact information in the chat. Uh, please note that as with all our EDI presentation, this is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the JSGS website at a later date. So now, after all of our uh, logistics, I am so pleased to be able to present to you today's speakers. So first of all, I'm going to go in the order that the speakers will present, starting with Dr. Genevieve Fuji Johnson, who's a professor of political science at Simon Fraser University. 
Genevieve Fuji Johnson studies and teaches feminist political thought with an emphasis on BWOC feminist scholars, solidaristic scholarship, democratic theory, interpretive policy analysis, qualitative methodology, and a range of current policy public policies issues, and her current research was sex workers' rights activists, educator and writer Carrie Porth focuses on the governance of sex work in Canada and the United States cities. They are currently working on a book project that develops a case for solidaristic scholarship that explicitly serves the justice struggles of marginalized communities. From January 2018 through April 2019, Dr. Johnson was Senior Advisor to the Provost Office on Faculty Inclusion, Diversity and Engagement at Simon Fraser University. Mohamed Hashem is the Executive Director of Canada Canadian Race Relations Foundation. Mohamed Hashem has worked as a labor organizer and a human rights advocate for over a decade, and he's dedicated his career to supporting equity, inclusion, and community empowerment. He currently is the executive director of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation and a member of the Board of Trustees of the United Way of Greater Toronto. Mr. Hashem is also a founding advisor of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. Carrie Ann Douglas Powell, Powell is manager of organizational transformation, anti racism De directorate, Government of Ontario. Carrie Ann is currently the manager of organizational transformation within the anti racism directorate and has the privilege of leading a team responsible for identifying and addressing organizational and cultural systemic racism barriers, building organizational competency and capacity around systemic racism, and how to identify, disrupt, and dismantle it, and providing support to leaders as they navigate through their anti-racism leadership journey. As a human rights professional and organizational educator and change leader, Carrie Ann thrives on designing innovative solutions that allow for people and organizations to navigate their way through chaos, especially during times of change, whether those changes are operational, cultural, or technological, all under the guise of learning and personal accountability. Last but not least, Neil Kuestep, executive in residence of Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. Neil has spent most of his career fostering relationships with government, community-based organizations, indigenous organizations, and educators. As the form, former interim director of the POP, population public health in the Saskatchewan Health Authority, his leadership led to increasing the infant and childhood immunization rates to close the gap between the most affluent neighborhoods and the inner city neighborhoods, and to addressing safe housing issues in a new way within the scope of the Public Health Act. He was also the strategic lead for cultural competency and truth and reconciliation commission activities of the population public health, which was a role he was proud to take on. Neil holds a master's of public administration degree from Johnson Shayama Graduate School and has a bachelor's degree in indigenous studies from First Nations University of Canada. In addition to his formal education, he counts his traditional training from elders as being as relevant in teaching him the role of a servant leader. He is currently an executive in resident with Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy. So I'm very pleased to turn the discussion over to our first speaker, Dr. Genevieve Fuji Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margot, and thank you, Karen, for organizing. Um, yeah, so incidentally, sorry to wreak a little havoc uh, at the get go. I actually like it when I can see people's faces when I'm presenting. Uh, I know the instructions have been to turn off your camera, but if you feel comfortable during my presentation, I'd love to see your beautiful faces. Um, so I'm really delighted to be uh, invited back to the Johnson Shoyama uh, Graduate School of Public Policy. Uh, I was here a few years ago and I continue to be a big fan of the school, uh, recommending it to lots of undergraduate and graduate students. It's really lovely to see all of you. Thank you to those of you who are sharing your beautiful faces with me and others. 
Um, so yes, my name is Genevieve Fuji Johnson, and I'm Yonsei, uh, which is a Japanese Canadian slash American term for fourth generation settler. Uh, I was born and raised on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam First Nation, and in particular, uh, the ancestral lands of the Point family, as they were named, uh, in what's now known as Steveston, British Columbia. I'm also of Irish ancestry, and that side of my family actually settled in Saskatchewan, uh, and then they moved to Vancouver. Uh, and I'm very proud of the histories of resilience uh, on both sides of my family. Uh, but I'm also reckoning uh, with uh, these four generations of our active participation in the displacement and marginalization of Indigenous peoples. And so uh, it's with this very much in mind, um, all the time, really, uh, these days, that I express my gratitude to the colloquiate uh, First Nation on whose lands uh, and in whose waterways I am currently um, on the west coast of what's known as Vancouver Island. So, uh, so I'm a professor and I'm going to do a professorial thing, which is to lecture just a little bit. Sorry, it's an occupational hazard. Uh, but one of the themes that I really want to just Put on the table uh, for discussion today um, about racism in the public service and possibilities uh, for anti-racism in such spaces is the multi-dimensional uh, nature of racism. So if there's one thing you take away from this talk today, it's that racism is not a monolith. Um, so I think it's pretty well established um, that there are two basic forms of racism as determined by their output or expressions. So one is direct or overt racism that's often expressed in racial epithets, right? So this form of racism is premised on the existence of races, on the existence of races organized into a normative hierarchy. So the lighter one's skin, the higher up uh, one sits on the hierarchy, the more privilege and more entitlement one has. Racist comments uh, and expressions, for example, in my case, being called a Jap and being spat on, uh, which has happened to me, uh, are overt expressions of this internalization of this uh, racialized uh, hierarchy or pyramid. Many people, perhaps especially white people who haven't directly experienced racism, including anti-Semitism, often think that this is the only form of racism. So, so long as we refrain from making racist comments, we don't have to worry about racism. Uh, but of course, this isn't the only form. Uh, and arguably, it's not the most pernicious, because we can see it. It's obvious. Um, I think actually a more common and more uh, pernicious form of racism is systemic. Like overt racism, this form of racism is premised on the existence of races, organized into a normative hierarchy of privilege and entitlement. But like, or rather unlike overt racism, systemic racism is systemic. <laughs> so it has an underlying logic. Again, the existence of races and the racialized hierarchy, but it's amorphous. I don't think, um, you know, I'm a woman in my, my 50s and, and I've been through and experienced a lot. So I don't think based on my uh, experiences that I'm exaggerating to say that it's in the very air that we breathe. So for example, I've been at SFU for, um, I don't know, 15 or 16 years. Uh, and when I go into work at Simon Fraser University, mid-sized university, research oriented in an urban and suburban uh, setting, and I'm the only racialized and minoritized woman faculty member in a meeting, not once, but regularly, frequently, I have to wonder, is this an outcome of internalized uh, systemic racism? For the longest time, uh, I was the lowest paid faculty member in my department. This despite always holding uh, a shirk uh, research grant, 
always publishing, always participating in tons of service, and so on. I have to wonder, is this a function of systemic racism? When I open a new book on democracy and future publics, as I did just last week, and I search my name to find that I'm not cited even once, even though my first book was literally on democracy for the future, I have to wonder, is this a function of systemic racism? So I'm sharing with you these personal stories, not with spite, but toward facilitating a uh, deeper thought on various forms of exclusion, devaluing, and erasure that are often, not always, but often a function of racism, as well as sexism and, of course, ableism. In addition to calling attention to overt and systemic racism, I want to also highlight different kinds of racism as determined by the target. So I briefly just, uh, and this really does warrant uh, more discussion, uh, but I wanna highlight the differences between anti-black and anti-brown racism, anti-indigenous racism uh, and anti-Asian racism. And of course there are many other forms of racism, again, uh, determined by the target. So when thinking about racism, I think it's important to recognize that just because certain groups are not targets of racism within a particular workplace or study place or wherever, um, this doesn't mean that racism, systemic racism or overt racism doesn't exist. So you can be, for example, working in a unit where anti-Asian racism doesn't exist, for example, but where anti-Black, anti-Brown, and anti-Indigenous anti racism is entrenched. So again, I just want to highlight that uh, racism is not a monolith, and what I've done in, in just this brief overview is to pre present a couple of uh, different kinds of racism, uh, the first set as determined um, by uh, their function or output, uh, and the second as determined by uh, their target. Um, so I think it's just important to keep this in mind as we have this conversation. Uh, and of course, um, these conversations um, really, I think, are meaningless unless we really take them seriously and carry them out with us uh, into the, the, the rest of our lives. Those are my opening remarks. Thank you very much. And over to my esteemed colleague, I think, uh, Neil or Mohammed, you were having it out in terms of the order, so I'm not really sure. I think it's me. Neil's gonna go last. He's, he, he wants the final word on things. Um, so good afternoon. Um, my name is Mohammed Hashim. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. We're a federal crown corporation under the Department of Canadian Heritage. Uh, and maybe I'll just talk a little bit, you know, how I came to this work and give you a bit of sense of where I come from. I am not an academic. I do not have a master's degree. I do not. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a union organizer by trade. Uh, that's what I did. I knew how to, I, I'm a community organizer. I know how to move public policy from like the grassroots, but also from like the, in the boardroom level, I do that well. Like academics, I do not do well. I, <laughs> and that's just the reality of who I am. You know, part of what I, like my journey started many, many years ago, but my journey around anti-racism really started around the 2015 uh, federal election. I was really getting sick and tired of how Muslims were being portrayed as the other, as the terrorist, as the one deserving of suspicion. So I started getting involved within the community at that point and, and, and started to, I held my first community town hall on what is Islamophobia in 2015. <clears throat> um, and because it, it wasn't a term that people understood at that time. I didn't understand it either, to be frank. Um, and then from there on, I started doing a lot of crisis management for the community because many organizations were then being, you know, labeled as suspicious, worthy of suspicion. People were worried about, you know, whether Syrian refugees coming in would be terrorists, whether they'd be ISIS supporters, or, you know, all these horrible things about, you know, Canadian Muslims being imposed about us. 
So a lot of the work that I had, and I've, I come from a very privileged environment within the Muslim community because my dad came in 1969. So I'm, like, I'm 43 years old and I'm kind of considered an, an elder within like the Canadian Muslim born, Canadian born Muslim community. Cause you know, we just been around for, for longer. So I kind of speak both community, but I can also speak regular Canadian. So I was able to translate the different worlds of, of you know, like immigrants coming here and, and whatnot. Uh, and then, you know, I started doing a number of those things. And then in 2017, one night I got a call from a friend of mine who worked at the National Council of Canadian Muslims. And she's like, you know, there's been a massacre in, in Quebec City. Can you go over there and help out on the ground? So the next morning I flew out to Quebec City. And, you know, obviously that, that's something that we all know, the, the impact that's had on Canada. But for me, it was right in front of me. Um, I met with, you know, so many different people helping tell their stories, uh, especially those of the, of the victims. And, you know, one, like, one of them really right, stands out. There was a young girl in the mosque who was, in, who was just playing at the back when people were praying. And her father was leading the prayers. And then when the gunman came in and he started shooting everybody, the men towards the back jumped on top of her to, to, to save her. While they were doing so, she saw her own father being shot. Um, and then when the gunman turned the gun to, to shoot her, he ran out of bullets. Um, and this is a person who went to go play at the back of the mosque or when her father was there to go pray in, here in Canada. It was a shocking moment for not like not just the Muslim Canadian Muslim community, but it, it was shocking for all of Canada that a place of worship could be desecrated so hard. And I've seen bloody carpets, I've seen bullet holes in walls. Um, and this is something that I know many within the Muslim community carry in terms of our memories. Um, so, you know, I was kind of surprised <laughs> You know, a few years later, when the government tapped me to say, "Here, here's our anti-racism crown corporation. Please go ahead and run it," um, but that's kind of where my story comes from. Like, I, I, I come from crisis management. I, I come to kind of push things forward and to to build new narratives. And now, you know, we have the I have the pleasure to work with an incredible team here at the foundation um, that does a number of different things. We're part of the federal public service. We get to work with the Federal Anti-Racism Secretariat led by Peter Flagel, who uh, is doing incredible amounts of work. Um, there's, I think there's 21 like federal anti-racism secretariats within different departments. The, the, the clerk of the Privy Council has made it a priority to make sure that there are these uh, anti-racism secretariats across the federal public service to look at the experience of public servants and see how they can better accelerate growth, accelerate promotions, make sure that opportunities are made available, but also how public policy is being developed with the lens of anti-racism as an ongoing commitment. A lot of the work that we're doing right now is on municipalities. So we are working with the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities to be able to bring together anti-racism practitioners from across the country to create a network so they can steal ideas from each other because there's, there's a huge variety. You know, you can see Toronto doing pilot projects on police diversion away from mental health um, responses. You can see Montreal looking at police reform. You can see other different municipalities doing different things. And some municipalities are, just have their first anti-racism committee of volunteers. So the spectrum is wide across the country around what anti-racism looks like in different municipalities. So we're bringing people together to kind of work on that. Um, we also work really closely with other Crown Corporations, the Canada Council for the Arts, the National Film Board, Telefilm, uh, the CBC. These are all within our family of clean heritage. And some of these organizations are colonial organizations. The NFB was created as a, as a propaganda arm for the government um, in, 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 the, in the World War II era. And not that they are anymore, but you know, like their 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 roots are are there. So there's like we we deal with these really sometimes old institutions that have ways of doing things, and and working with them has been very collaborative. Uh, next week we're going to be doing um, launching some work around hate crimes. 
Um, we're doing a task force, or I'm co-leading ta an intergovernmental task force with the RCMP uh, to address hate crimes in Canada. So that's launching next week to talk about, you know, how are police responses? How are people reporting? Who's reporting? Who's not reporting? How do we, um, what information do, does, is necessary for people to bring when they go report? Do they go in person? Do they do it online? Uh, what does training look like? All these different things around uh, hate crimes. So we're gonna be examining all of that uh, starting next week. But I'll leave it over there because I'm sure we'll have questions after. And, uh, I'll kick it over to Neil for now. Thank you for having me, by the way. Great, and thank you. Uh, Carrie Ann is not joining us from her regular position, so she hasn't joined us yet, and we will move to Neil. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Margot. Thank you to uh, Genevieve and to Mohammed. Um, I was just hoping for Carrie. I was hoping everyone would get here and that they take all the time and then there's no time left for me. And then that's kind of my been my MO through my career. That's kind of how I get onto these panels and lists. After hearing these intros and, and these bios, I'm, holy smokes, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> I think you might have got by someone else, me mixed up with someone. But um, yeah, holy smokes. I'm, I'm not an academic. I'm not a organizer and I feel really lazy after I heard all the activities that Mohammed is doing. Uh, I'm here just to tell old stories of my old employer <laughs> and I'm trying to be sensitive and not throw anyone under the bus or anything but no my name is Neil Q-Step. You, you, you heard my bio a little bit from Margo. Um, I'm a First Nations man from uh, Yellow Quill and Fishing Lake First Nations respectively here in Saskatchewan. Um, I'm, I'm Soto. Um, I, I did a little bit of work with the health authority uh, before, thankfully before this pandemic. And you heard my, my former occupation was in population and public health. So thankfully to everybody, I was out of there before that job became really important to, to the world. And, and we had to rely on those folks to navigate us through a pandemic. Um, but while I was there, um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe follow up a little bit on Mohammed. So just how, how the heck did I find myself here? And, and it really is, I think it's like, I've always, <clears throat> I've always felt like the character in Titanic. I don't know if anyone has watched that. I'm dating myself a little bit now. Uh, Titanic, and I've always felt like Kathy Bates, you know, the character in there, and they call her new money in there, right? Where she's, she's not supposed to be with all the rich people, you know, and not supposed to be with all of these accomplished people, right? And, but she snuck in there somehow and she's there. <clears throat> And one of the cool things she does while she's there with the space is she she reaches down, you know, she reaches down and she got Jack, you know, she pulled Jack up and then Jack got Rose, you know, and so she's created space. And I felt like, you know, one of my roles um, from where I come from is I'm a helper. So part of part of my role before I got actually trained in anything was um, just help. You know, that's kind of been my primary function and purpose in life is do what you can. So try to follow people that are doing good work and just help them out, you know. So I'm really happy to kind of join my colleagues here and, and do my best, you know, to, to see how I can help and, and add some value to this conversation. I want to say a special thank you to some of you that have been following along this EDI series, because I really do think that's how I got here. I think there was some trolling that happened on the last one that said, get a little bit more diverse, get a little bit more diverse. And so here, that's usually where I get my turn is, is when, you know, when we need diversity people. So here I am, new money, you know, ready, ready to make space for more people, right? So if I'm here, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to share stories, I think, of while I was with the health authority, though, uh, I needed to help. You know, and part of my bio was that we changed some things. Some of my most proud things is I've never delivered an immunization in my life, but it's one of the biggest impacts uh, my, the team I got to work with and support uh, made. And it was neat and it was interesting because that's, it's, it's kind of where my career started to, to take off, you know, and I owe it all to those folks doing that work. Uh, no health training in my body, no anything. But I think the one, the one thing is we had the, the poorest neighborhoods to work with. So closest thing to a reserve, eight out of 10 people we were serving was First Nations. I'm gonna go really quick. By the end of, within five years, um, was a 
interim program manager to a program manager, elevated to a manager, and then I was running population public health within five years. And it was because we changed some things. And that's why I think I'm just a good storyteller. I, I, I didn't do any of the gosh darn work. I just told, told, told the story. Some of the things, they, the rates had stagnated at 40% historically, always just 40% within their hard to reach a population, tough to engage, so they're not interested in their health. You know, all of the typical stereotypes just go in, you know, kind of following on what Mohammed said, you know, around uh, Islamic folks, you know, same, similar to indigenous people. Oh, that's why. And it, and it just fits so good. And we don't have to question those narratives because they've, been, they've become so entrenched and ingrained in who we are. And then we just started seeing things. And I remember talking to my team and, and you know, some of the, I remember some of the first things they said was, oh, culture is not important here. That's not what this, this community needs. And I was shocked, you know, and it's nothing against the people, but um, I just thought like, holy smokes, you know, I, I wish I could be there, you know, when I've grown up hating who I am and, and everything about my culture, you know, and eight out of 10 people we served was, was from the same place as me. And this was obviously a non-Indigenous person, but a really, really nice person, you know, very nice person, made some relationships uh, themselves in the community, but was a very senior person amongst the staff on the team. And it was just that attitude you could see, like why we were producing the outcomes that we were producing, you know, is that it, if you don't believe that there's going to be, there's anything good here, you, you don't, your behavior is going to help you predict and, and create those outcomes. That's, that's my belief. I don't have, I work at a university, but believe me, I'm just full of anecdotes and stories and hope. That's all I got. <clears throat> we started to change the team. You know, I, I, we, that's the cool thing about health. There's lots of opportunities for churn come up. You know, it burns people out. Nurses get, you know, we ask them to do way too much, you know, and don't give them enough. I seen that as an opportunity where we had to work with unionized people and uh, you started to see some of the barriers and it wasn't there, but it was just, no one was advocating to create more room, you know? There wasn't enough um, new monies uh, in the, at the conversation tables to try to bring more people up on board, you know, that were different than there, right? So one of the neat things for me while I was there is we were, we were focused on equity, you know, we were a place called Building Health Equity. I didn't even know what the heck equity meant. I thought it was the same as uh, equalization, you know, or <laughs> just the same. And then I started to realize and get an appreciation for what it was and started to ask, well, we talk about it lots, but what are we doing ourselves? You know, and you start to hold your own organization to account for. Don't just tell people we're doing those things. You have to do them. Like you can't do that. And you can't get me now in front of eight out of 10 people I serve telling them that I'm actually working towards this when I see little activity kind of moving that way. So you start to kind of become the thorn in the side, you know, and people say, okay, well, what, what should we do? We had a committee that said, okay, we're, we're doing something that's leading equity, diversity. It was just called equity at that time. There was no, we weren't including diversity and inclusion yet in those days, but now we are, right? So I was the only male at the table and I was the only brown person. So there was a natural assumption, that's the expert at our table. So they gave it to me, you know, and bless their hearts, you know, there was nothing but good intentions there because they weren't bad people, you know, those are my friends and I'm not here to, to slam any of my friends. But I think one of the things that was my first smash of, of uh, ignorance, you know, when it gets, it, what's, there's not overt racism, but that's what it looks like inside of those systems. You know, there's just the, the assumptions kick in, all of the, all of the stereotypes just naturally happen. No one will say anything bad or, oh, that give it to the Indian. No one will say those words. No, one, that's not how it looks. That's the easy overt stuff that uh, Genevieve was talking about. Those things don't rarely happen, especially when you're wearing a suit like this. That was another way I learned to protect myself was to look different. You know, you, you realize a part of this is classism, you know, and learn to protect yourself. Um, that's not to say racism has gone down because it, it hasn't, you know, I've just learned to protect myself from, it, you know, because there's people that are now getting my, my cup of it, you know, that look a lot different. Than me. And so the neat thing for us is we talked about it all the time. I was tasked with leading it. I'm running out of time here. So I'm going to jump way ahead. We can get to other stories, but our, the other thing we, we increased health, you know, we, we, Put it near the gosh darn top. We were at 70% uh, coverage rates. Some of the coolest, the highest highlights of that story was we 
we doubled my indigenous staff representation and I used I used an evidence base, you know, to, to start attacking this because I worked for a health institution that needed evidence, not just anecdotes. Give me the evidence for why we got to do this. Gave them all the evidence, you know, my brother is in the room here. He did a survey for us, you know, uh, with the United Way of Saskatoon and area at the time that asked Indigenous human service users their preferences. I used that body of literature because we were a patient first organization. So I made sure that we were using the evidence that was readily available to us. One of the things it said is that three out of four people asked they wanted to be served by somebody who looks like them. And then the neat thing is I was able to talk to my brother Ash Casey as he's in the room. Um, how how did that happen? Like what what was the follow up to that question? And people were saying. I'll be served by anyone who's green, but my experience shows me that I'll be treated with respect and dignity in greater greater chances if I'm served by somebody who looks like me. That helped me get to our uh, hiring, which was 4% from jumping around. We, long story short, our coverage rate turned into 70%. We had the, we doubled our coverage rates. We did it cheaper. We uh, diversified our staff even more. So we, People thought, holy smokes, what are you doing? I remember I got a call from the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Disease, and they said, Neil, if we could replicate what you're doing, we would put it in our water. That's how rare it is. Ever since we've been counting, this thing hasn't happened. And I was so proud to tell that story, doing none of the work, obviously, like this this, like this panel, <laughs> but just getting to tell the story that just give us a chance, give us a chance and we can help. You know, we've got part of the solutions. We hired people right from our community. Got a chance to the um, hiring, we moved our target from 4% to 10%. And it was already just staying at 10% as far as uh, diversity hires or representative workforce, all in less than a year, all like within 18 months, you know? So it stayed plateaued there. We actually dedicate some efforts to it. It exploded. The sky didn't fall. The health authority is actually still running. It didn't crumble. Uh, it, it was still good. Amazing people still working there. Just pushed us through a pandemic safely for the most part for everybody. I know we have huge losses, but it was super awesome. I, I loved it. Happy to be here today. Um, let's get some questions. Thanks, Neil. That was so great and so insightful, so impactful, Genevieve and Mohammed. So a lot of commonalities, and I can see um, a lot of similarities. But Genevieve, you went first and you defined your uh, impacts, your outputs, your systemic versus direct. So I'm wondering after you've heard Neil and Mohammed, if you have any thoughts. Oh, so, I mean, so many thoughts. Um, and I guess, I mean, one thing I was definitely hearing that was in common between Mohammed and Neil was this kind of deference. Um, you know, you both mentioned not having academic credentials and so on, but, you know, and, and Neil, you were talking about storytelling and you know i just want to say like i think it's recognizing and embracing our personal stories that really this is the way forward in terms of addressing systemic racism it's one of the ways forward um you know i i, I So as racialized and minoritized people as, as the three of us are, we have so many stories, personal stories, stories related to our families, like our grandparents and our parents and our brothers and sisters and cousins and so on. And it's these stories of racism um, and sexism and uh, discrimination on the basis of religion, for example. Um, it's these stories that I want people who haven't had these negative experiences, I want them to hear these stories because I want them to be moved uh, by these stories in a way that we've been moved by them. Um, I don't wish these negative experiences on anyone, but if the goal is to address racism, systemic and overt racism, then people who haven't had these experiences, they need to feel what it's like to be spat on, 
right? Or they need to feel what it's like to walk away from a meeting thinking, did that, did that just happen? <laughs> you know, uh, and what was that all about? Was that, was that racism and sexism? You know, like there's this very um, emotive component to existence that we express through our stories. And I don't want to lose sight of that. And so I really, really appreciate your stories, Neil and Mohammed. I appreciate where you're coming from and all of your contributions. So yay, storytelling. Thanks for that. And I really was captured, Genevieve, by your uh, identify, identification that there's uh, it's the target, and they're very different forms of racism. But then when I'm hearing uh, the stories and you all speaking, there's such commonalities in, in being the recipient of hate or the recipient of racism that I'm hearing from the stories that, that they aren't so expressly different. But Genevieve, do you have thoughts on, on what I'm saying? I mean, I, I do have thoughts and I just want to say, like, don't get me started because, again, professor and I might not stop. I do want to make sure that Neil and Mohammed, it's too bad Carrie Ann isn't here yet. Um, so I do have lots of things to say. I've just started really thinking about differences um, in uh, forms of racism as defined by uh, the target of racism, so differences between anti-Black, for example, and anti-Asian racism. I know that they exist. Um, I also know that there is a lot of commonality. Uh, my very early thinking is that um, there are differences in what stereotypes offer in terms of burdens and opportunities. Um, and so as an Asian woman, uh, as a light skinned woman, you know, I do have an opportunity in the stereotype of the model minority. Uh, I have resisted that um, uh, uh, myself, but it is available. Um, so, um, so there's something I think when I really think about this, there's something to do with, uh, it has something to do with stereotypes. And again, the burdens as well as benefits conferred by the stereotypes that are entrenched, so deeply entrenched. And then that translates into, uh, I think, impact. Um, anyway, again, I don't want to monopolize. I want to give Neil and Mohammed a chance to jump in. Yeah, uh, I can jump in. I mean, I, I mean to be frank, I kind of shy away from the commonalities stuff frequently because to be frank, like, I mean, you know, I, you and I have not lived the same lives, <laughs> like, like, you know, straight up. It's not true. Like, you know, I grew up in Mississauga. It's, you know, in a, in a one bedroom apartment with my mom, and my sister, you know, sure. We, we, we feel like a fish out of water in places. Yeah, that's true. We have a corny sense of humor. That's absolutely true. Uh, we laugh through pain. That's true. Uh, but otherwise, our life experience is completely different. And this is where I, I kind of I, I like to shy away from finding the commonalities sometimes in terms of what racism feels like amongst people because it's totally different and the solutions are different. Um, and like dealing with things like, you know, when we kind of say, okay, well, we're going to create a solution that an EDI committee that's going to look at racism and solve all racism in the workplace. That's complete nonsense, right? Like, like you know, like the barriers that like are stopping me from inclusion are completely different from the barriers who's you know like somebody who is indigenous who's living in, in Regina or Saskatoon. That's not the same experience. I'm not you know brown guy from Mississauga is not getting the same experience as that. So like you know I would I would I would shy away from finding the commonalities on things. There are massive regional differences across this country. Like if I were like you know this week I was speaking to people in Toronto, I live in Toronto, and we were talking, you know, just like having a conversation, what's the biggest issue around racism? And then they're like, oh, it's the cops. We need police reform. We need to do something with the police. Last week I was in Edmonton. I was like, what is the number one issue of racism here? They're like the child welfare system. And I'm like, what? I thought it's not the cops here too. Like, you know, doesn't Toronto's, 
anti-racism lens to find the entire countries? You know, that's simply not the case. It's just the arrogant Trontanians think that. Um, but like, you know, an adamant, like, you know, and, and it was, it was, it was incredibly stark. And I was, you know, I'll just give you a quick story. I was, I was speaking to um, Miss Whiskey Jack. Uh, she runs um, a caring society that looks after kids. And she was talking about how the child, well, you know, first of all, the child welfare system felt was like seen as a continue. It was like the transition out of residential schools of snatching indigenous kids away from family and separating them from community. And, and, you know, so it was, first of all, it was the transition, but then also just like, even just recently she was saying, you know, there was uh, a man who had a, you know, a six-year-old daughter who, you know, fell on hard times um, with some addiction issues and, you know, child welfare came in to, and, and an Indigenous man to, you know, to take over. The the guy's sister comes from Ontario and says, yeah, I'll take him, I'll, I'll, I'll take her. Like, I got a, I, I got a home and, and two kids back home. I'll take her. And, and they said, no, like that kid is a ward of Alberta and needs to stay there. And that same agency had another man who had five kids. He was from Newfoundland, a white man. And they said, uh, and it's exact same situation where the family from Newfoundland came, uh, was, came to, uh, to Alberta and said, yeah, we'll take him. And the child welfare system said, yeah, okay, no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll buy you five tickets and as a social worker and we'll deliver them over to Newfoundland. Like the, the, the ability to like make the provisions to keep people together within a, like a circle of love and care within a family and a community was just not extended. And this is like two weeks ago. Um, and that just tells you how different experiences are in different places, but also um, like that we can't just find the commonalities and try to address it the same way. I'll stop there. No, thank you. So insightful. and. And there really, there is such a variety of experience that you're all speaking so, so eloquently to, but, but the commonality of systemic racism and the power structures, is there any ability to find commonality through colonization or decolonization more aptly? Um, and is there any links, Mohammed, that could be made with uh, learning around Islamophobia, learning for people about what it is and what the implications are and how people in Saskatchewan or other places than Toronto actually are partaking in Islamophobia? Like, is there a common ability to rise up and address systemic racism and how we see it? I, one of the things I think, and Mohammed can answer for himself here, I, well, I've seen him jump off mute, he, he can answer, but okay. I think for me, when you ask that question though, and like the commonalities, and that was kind of one of the things when I was tasked with the responsibility to start figuring this stuff out, again, exactly as Mohammed said, you know, I think the one thing that I found with um, white people or around where I live, I've only worked in Saskatchewan and Saskatoon in particular. So I'm going to say that, you know, and no offense to anybody, you know, or anything, but I, I've never worked in the East or West. I, I live at home and I'm never gonna leave. Um, this is where I'm staying. But I think for me, one of the neat things is we water it down and try to just make them all the same, exactly as Mohammed said, you know, and one of the things that I realized when you were, there were smart people that developed a theory for how you address all of these things. And they started by stop doing your awareness activities. We, you know, Saskatchewan has done a ton of Aboriginal awareness and those types of things. And when you start doing those, you start seeing, gosh, that crowd is so exhausted of that, you know, that they've become almost resentful to have another one of those things. I remember one lady saying, Neil, you know, there's more than ab uh, more culture than Aboriginal culture. Like it was such a silly question. I responded with no, no, there isn't. No, like, it was, of course, of course. The, the, <laughs> but that's how exhausted the, the, the crowd has become. So one of the things, according to the literature that you find, is that if you were to see it as a continuum, cultural awareness would be like your first step. Oh, wow, there's culture. 
and then you move along and, and you get kind of closer to the other end. And again, I've been out of the field for a bit. Cultural safety is kind of the one of the one of those steps near the further end. There's another one now, cultural humility, I think it is, but it keeps evolving and it's cool. But the coolest thing about that is it it gives you responsibility to say, quit looking at other people and trying to figure out them. Look in the gosh darn mirror and figure out what are your own biases that you keep carrying? Why can't you see that there's wrong happening and that it has become a part of the way we do things? You know, and so those are those were the neat things about the literature when I followed people like Genevieve, you know, who've actually been really smart people that, you know, are helping people like me just help them. How do you how can we help? And and I and it's and it's an area that was awesome because you've got the most agency there. I can't, you don't even need to allocate more resources as an organization. Just tell your people to start looking at their own biases and give them space during work time to do it. That, that one of the biggest challenges is we were only having these conversations at our water coolers and none of our leaders were actually putting them on agendas to ask their staff, you know, how, what are your experiences around this? And it was always, we'll get there when we get there. We never got there. And then it became all of this other thing, right? And so many other bigger problems came on there. And then we're getting more diverse. One of the things in Saskatchewan is that the indigenous population is going to be the majority here one day, you know, and it's gonna be those pressures that are actually going to, to force our public policy people to start doing things differently, you know, and they're going to see, you mean we could have been taking steps all along? You know, there's people like anti-racism stuff. That was, it was neat. There's a lady in here, Becky Sasakamu's Kuffner. She's that expert who we'll follow up with her. She was, I just leaned on her the same way I'm leaning on my panel here. She said, if I could do it all again, I'd start with anti-racism, you know, do that. Mm -hmm. And I think their solutions are gonna be different. But I think the, the neat thing is we need to stop asking panels like this. What, what do we do? Look in the mirror and start you, you can do everything, you know, start to see, why don't you like tall people? Why don't you like short people? Why don't you like brown people? Why do you lock your doors when brown people come? Like just, you don't even have to like have an uncomfortable conversation. You can start to ask yourself those in any safe place you want, whether you're cruising in your car, getting ready for work, those things. And that was the neatest part for us. We got to see, and then people started finding comfort and I remember I got called a racist at this one time and then you start unpacking things. I remember the coolest thing was, Neil, when you talk about representative workforce, it feels like you don't want us here. Oh my gosh, then you just, the work is so easy after that. You walk them away and say like, when in the history, you know, have we nationalized, you know, a whole collective agreement and said, no, it's not your turn anymore. We're gonna not honor that and replace you all with another workforce. Like you have to walk people off the ledge of the real practical things. For us in the health authority, it was easy to say, one of the biggest complaints from all of our staff was, we're never fully staffed, we're never fully staffed <laughs> because of all the movement and position. So I said, well, aren't those opportunities for us to find diversity here? You know, it'll help us actually be staffed and alleviate a concern that you have. So it was just easy. Once you have the conversations and you see, you stop trying to blame BIPOC even, I, that's a new one for me in the lexicon, <laughs> but I'm a BIPOC apparently too. But again, those things, you know, we, we keep saying, what, what are they doing? Why, how come they don't just be like us or, you know, those are the, the challenges though. The, I, I come from treaty territory. I'm waiting for the day we actually get to live that treaty. You know, I, I think of my tomb stories, my grandfather's stories and said, we're ready, we're ready to share. We're ready to grow together. Uh, you know, my uh, I like my one little story from the health authority that I feel like I made a contribution. You know, we didn't wreck it. You know, we didn't wreck it. It's still staying there. We actually improved it before we left. You know, so that, that was super cool. Sorry, Genevieve, I seen you jump off me. But I... Oh, yeah, no, Neil, there's just so much. I mean, so much that I, I, I'd like to just take a second to respond to. Neil, first of all, I got to say, you helped me just seeing your lovely face and your demeanor um, and your stories. Um, and also, yeah, look in the mirror. I think that this is really, really important. Uh, I think it's important. So the purpose of today's talk is to figure out ways that um, we can be addressing uh, racism in the public service. And I think a really good starting point is, yeah, wake up in the morning and take a good look at yourself. And don't begin with, I'm not a racist. Begin with, I am a racist. 
I do participate in racism. Just try that out. And that's really going out uh, to people with white skin privilege and light skin privilege as well, like myself. Um, so, so I wanted to say that, but I also just want to push back respectfully uh, uh, Mohammed and Niels, um, you know, just like you're really driving home the point that our experiences are different. And yes, they are very different. And of course, there are also issues of class uh, as well and gender as well. Um, and of course, ability and neurodiversity as well. And so all of these factors, as well as the presence of intergenerational trauma and all of these factors play into our different experiences. But the three of us, I am sure that we have all been othered. We've all had that eyeball on us because of our skin color. You know, uh, you may have been spat on as well. I hope not. Um, so there, I think that there is you know, there is an othering, there is a dominance of whiteness that uh, this racialized hierarchy exists. There's a dominance of whiteness that uh, permits this othering and permits sort of all of this work to keep us in our places. And this plays out in the public se sector, it plays out in corporations, it plays out in universities. And so um, in addition to all of us, um, you know, doing the hard work of learning about other people's histories uh, of exclusion, uh, but also of privilege and entitlement. In addition to that, doing that work, I'm asking those with decision-making authority in this room, uh, in this space, to get on with data collection. Like, seriously, this needs to happen, and it needs to happen um, in a really robust way. So we need intersectional data. We need disaggregated data, not just, you know, BIPOC, not just racialized minorities, right? We need um, data that mirrors uh, the Stats Canada um, categories uh, for uh, ethnic and racialized backgrounds. Um, so we need that data that's disaggregated. We also need data that is intersectional, that brings together uh, gender expression, um, as well as racialized identity, uh, as well as ability stat status and class. So we need that as well. We also need longitudinal data. So not just, this is what it looks like now. Uh, we need to be collecting data that can be uh, compared over time periods. And this data needs to be publicly available. So women in the room, we all know um, that uh, one of the things that's holding us back in terms of the, the pay gap is that salaries, you know, there's a lot of secrecy around salaries, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, with respect to um, civil servants, uh, public servants, you know, a lot of that data is made available. Uh, but still, we know that the masking of this information is a mechanism <laughs> that maintains the status quo, that maintains, in this case, the gender pay, pay gap. Um, and so I just think that, you know, as a, as a first step, we need good data to show us the representational gaps, to show us the pay gaps, to show us the gaps um, in, in terms of career progress and to show us gaps and or to show us trends in uh, people leaving the workforce. Um, thank you. Go data. Thanks, Genevieve. There's actually a question uh, in the chat and it's around the data and that um, and maybe Mohammed, you'd have some insights or Neil into your uh, public facing work where Mohammed, if you're working with the secretariat, the anti racism secretariat and they're gathering all this information and data, is it often called not rigorous? Our storytelling isn't rigorous. It's not the same standard as other evidence. And this is actually asked by an Indigenous researcher uh, that is attending here today? Um, that's a really good question because, I mean, not all data is taken equally uh, and not all stories are believed equally. 
Um, and not all pain is recognized equally either. So, I mean, yeah. You know, I, I, this is something that we struggle with all the time because public policymakers want to see the data um, and they want to see the quantifiable hard data that says, um, and that they, and they, you know, we only published the report on truth and reconciliation in 2015, but how long have been people have people been sharing that data? Um, and that tells you something in terms of whose knowledge is believed versus whose isn't. Um, and um, so there's that. Um, I think there's some progress in terms of um, people believing different forms of information. Um, I don't think it's like, you know, like in the environments that I work with, within, you know, it's not all numbers anymore. I'm, right now, the federal government is looking at introducing online hate legislation. Uh, that conversation is not strictly based on that. Uh, because if we were, we would just be feeding off the algorithm, all, like all the algorithm, Lee algorithm, Lee created data from Facebook and Twitter. That's what we'd be basing our information on, but or or other uh, sources. But you know, you can't you can't just look at impact that way. So I think that the, that they are listening to people, and and they are listening to people's stories, and I think that you know, more and more, especially in terms of understanding truth from an indigenous perspective, um, I think there is a greater recognition that the hard numbers don't tell the truth. Um, because to be frank, if you were to do a poll uh, and there's the reconciliation barometer at the University of Manitoba just did a poll in terms of understanding what um, Canadians' expectations of reconciliation, how far we've gotten towards reconciliation are, um, they have polled uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks. And, um, and the information there is quite excellent, but finding a sample size uh, that's uh, relevant to make that those assertions is difficult. And there's an incredible amounts of biases, even when you take geographic uh, responses into place, like, Socioeconomic circumstances play into it too. So, um, so if you're if you're more wealthy, you're able your your expectations of reconciliation going better are higher within indigenous communities um, versus the other way around. Um, and so, even your re your regional spread of data doesn't tell the right story in terms of where things are. So, I think that you know the hard evidence is 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 needed. To be frank, for policymakers to, to understand to, to look to to understand the issue, but I think the impetus to move happens more from real stories than from the data. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's so um, so in, in inspiring to think about um, the, the importance of stories and the importance of people uh, and their stories. So there's actually a question uh, for Neil around your talk about having to wear a suit and a suit jacket. And well, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, today I'm wearing Kenneth Cole awareness. So is that, uh, no, I, I don't think that was the question. But I think I'm gonna answer two questions. I, I like the one, I seen another one on reluctance to self-declare. Same challenge that we had at the health authority, indigenous people self who the heck wants to be the only one if you know you're the only person there? We, that was one of the most obvious things we found out when we started asking our people. One of the first things you have to do is you have to just ask the question, you know, are we self? And if you know, you know, if you're the manager or someone who does the counting, you're the bean counter for your group and you have to count your Indigenous people and you know that no one's showing up on your self-declaration because that's how we decide that that's how they're counted usually now i'll go back to the study that we had that was done by the uh, united way we were uh, we for and this is a health specific one but we were a so health people in my experience they love helping like that's why that's why they get up in the morning they want to help and that's that was the awesomest thing of working in that environment in the health field was that everyone wants to help 
And so one of the things we showed them, we said, your patients actually want you to self-declare if you're Indigenous. They want to see themselves reflected in the workforce. So we showed our Indigenous staff that, that, that piece of data. And so that, that was our incentive. I learned from the smartest lady, Janice McKinnon, people follow the incentives. She was a public policy maker. And you know what? Indigenous people, we're people too, believe it or not. You know, that was one of the coolest things in my experience of how I showed people in the health authority was that we're not just Indians or Indigenous, we're people, you know, we're part of the human family. You know, we've got 40, the same amount of chromosomes as you, believe it or not, and all of those, uh, the pigmentation just looks a little bit different. Sometimes only, you know, if you go to other parts of the country, they look the same as you. Um, so those were some of the, the neat things that we found about the data. The other thing that we found was that we, we doubled our hiring without making one single hire, just by asking that question and showing people literally step-by-step step where you go and self-declare on your online system. Didn't even have to hire one person. We doubled our rate when I told you we went from 4% to 10%. Doubled it overnight without making one hire. Then the other thing, we counted how far the target was. We had a population of three, our uh, staffing of 300 and just over 300 FTEs. 10% of 300 is only 30. And once you start saying we can't even hire 30 Indigenous people here, you start kind of getting on people's ego, right? Like, oh, yes, we can, you know? And so they start digging in and you start getting a little bit of support. You find it. So that was one of, you got to give, give people incentives to actually show and be proud, you know, not just, you know, we're going to count you and that's it. But give, give people different incentives, I think. And the story of why the suit, uh, I think one of the, the neat things is early, um, you realize that you're experienced a way less racism and discrimination if you look like you have more money than people. <laughs> no, there, there's no hard science behind that. Uh, in my experience, my racisms have gone down. When I, on the weekend, when I have my ball cap and my sweats on, mm, I know I'm an Indian where I live, you know? When I go to work, mm, I'll, I'll follow on the classism thing and, and know that I can protect myself Monday to Friday uh, looking like this. Yeah, thank you. That's so interesting because I think you guys have really highlighted how equity, diversity and inclusion, we have to consider systemic racism. But mo moving into inclusion, Neil, we're really getting at some of the, the um, difficult area about what inclusion is. And I, I don't know if people have heard of the, the equity, diversity, inclusion, comparing it to being, in, being invited to a dance and uh, equity having how much space you have on the floor and inclusion being asked to dance. And then there's quite a debate going on whether where equity, diversity, inclusion sits on that and whether how far we can take inclusion to actually achieve that feeling of belonging, belonging for all people. So is there, is there kind of a, a place that we're going of inclusion and what we're striving to achieve in the future that we can share with our uh, audience? I, want, I, my, I'll, I know a shortcut, actually. I'll tell you shortcuts because I don't want to wait another 20, 30 years for another report to come out and tell us what we should have done. Give BIPOC, I'll, now I'll use some technical terms, give BIPOC people hiring power in your organizations. If you want to take a shortcut to how you actually get more diverse, give them hiring power, please. It wasn't a secret that, you know, we got more Indigenous after our director was an Indigenous person. It's, you know, it's, it's one of the ways we're going to make space. It's one of the ways we can be new money ourselves and bring all of the jacks up so they can meet their rows, you know. And you're going to find out the sky isn't going to fall in your organization, you know. I, one of the ugliest doors I had to come through was being the equity hire. It's gross, you know, but one of the things I learned to live with, if that's the only door in for me, I got to show them that I belong in those other places. I just finished reading the Obama's books, both of them, you know, their latest books. I love them, you know. They often get asked from other um, uh, African-American people, why didn't you do more for Black people? You know, why didn't you do more for Black people? And they're very conscious that, you know, the system they were in, they were only allowed to move it, you know, 
sneakily, you know, and do the universal systems, knowing that, you know, within those systems, like the justice system and those, the people most affected by that were going to be people like them. And so that was the neat thing that I learned about public policy too. Why I love the equity words, you know, is because when I started doing the strategies, I knew that it was going to be Indigenous people that were going to have the greatest change in their life, you know. So I like the Obamas, they give me hope too, right, that, you know, when they're given criticisms that people tell us, oh, your heads are in the clouds, you know, you don't see all, of course we do, you know, we've got our feet firmly planted in today with our feet pointed towards tomorrow, you know, and I think that's the responsibility of rooms like this, we all got to help, you know, nobody's coming to save it or make it better for us, everybody who's going to do it is already here, so we have to do it. Great. Thank you. Genevieve, you've been quiet for a while. Uh, yes, I, I, you know, I think these terms are useful and using them together are useful. Um, I also think it's important to include um, indigenizing or even better decolonization, decolonizing. Um, but for the moment, I'll just, uh, I just have a few words about uh, inclusion and sort of the interrelatedness. Like personally, when I walk into a meeting and it still happens and I'm the only uh, racialized and minoritized faculty member, uh, woman faculty member, walk into a meeting with all white people, I don't feel included. And so here is where diversity plays a role in facilitating a sense of inclusion, right? Um, or if, as I found out painfully that I was one of the lowest paid member or the lowest paid member in my department for many years, this is a question of equity, <laughs> but I didn't feel included, right? I, <laughs> and so these things are fundamentally intertwined, I think. The inclusion piece, I think, is important to not lose sight of because you you can actually have the diversity and you can have the pay equity and the career progress equity and equal opportunities in the workforce and so on and still feel excluded because of the microaggressions and the comments and um, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, coming coming from students, that happens, and then not being supported by, you know, your chair or your supervisor uh, who doesn't quite get it. Um, so, so in the same, I think, can be said, you can have all of the EDI stuff and still be a colonial and violent institution, right? And so these things are fundamentally intertwined and we have to take each one of them seriously um, to realize all of them, I think, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you for that. So the systemic racism, the colonization, but are there other ways of thinking about power structures and power structure practices. So there's a comment and question about um, the commonality of the human rights code, the commonality of practices of othering uh, that might draw together these very unique experiences of racism against indigenous brown black, the different types of racism. Um, would that be something uh, that is not only have you guys all mentioned white people like myself thinking about our privilege and recognizing it, that uncomfortableness, but the practices of othering and how we do that in our everyday lives, who our friends are, who we hang around with, who we share our colleagues, or who we mentor, and how do we disrupt and dismantle those practices? And is it through education about othering? How do we do that in a subtle, subtle way? I think it's about, I mean, personally, let me just jump in quickly and then I'll hand the floor over. But you know, Margo, it's a great question and thank you for raising it. And you know, it's more than good intentions and it's more than, okay, I have to think about my privilege, <laughs> right? It's okay, I need to think about my privilege I need to look at my friendship circle 
who who's included and who's excluded? I think I actively need to spend time with folks that, you know, don't look like me, don't eat the same food as me. I'm sure they're in your circle. You know, genuinely reach out, offer, exp- you know, be vulnerable, develop relationships. And I, I do think that this is a basic principle that we should all be applying in our, um, in all aspects of our lives if we're taking this seriously. And so, yeah, as a matter of practice, you know, I make a point of primarily, I mean, my husband is white, um, but I make a point of, you know, primarily interacting with other racialized and minoritized individuals and learning about them and having them over to my home. Um, I make a point as a scholar uh, uh, of of citing um, BIPOC scholars and not just not just randomly citing them, citing them because they, they deserve to be there and they should be there, but also making a point of citing them first. I mean, that's just a little sort of thing that I do. I mean, I make a point of, you know, acknowledging my um, my Indigenous and Black and Brown uh, and, uh, you know, um, Asian students uh, to, you know, let them know that I'm here if they want to talk to me, you know, I'm here for them, that kind of thing. So it's about acting on uh, your good intentions, really, and putting yourself in positions that are, are, that involve a little bit more work and that are uncomfortable, I think. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes I know I was on a chat and it wasn't me, but it could have been me. Someone was speaking about the annexation of Crimea and a scholar went on and said, corrected them saying, don't use that language. It's not the annexation. It's the, I, I can't remember, I think the illegal occupation of Crimea. So, you know, being open to being corrected, but having that respectful practice in place where, where, I, we assume that the correction will happen. And how do we create a workspace, create uh, an institutional space, interorganizationally, create that type of space? And it kind of feeds into one of the questions from Roberta, and I, I know the scholar in me is doing this, and you may not see the leap, but talking a bit about racial violence, racial trauma that's not being acknowledged by various colonial institutions, and how can we how can we open this up so that we see it? We don't allow our language or our thought processes to not recognize these practices and actually address them in policy. Um, Do you have any thoughts around that? I mean, I can jump in, (laughs) that's okay. I asked hard questions. I'm sorry. No, no. I mean, I think that there's there's a number of, of things that, that I wanted to kind of, there's a few questions that popped up as well in terms of, you know, uh, I, think, I think it was Christine or Charlene or who mentioned about the United Nations Human Declaration for Human Rights. You know, of course, there's commonalities and in, in stuff that the work the, that that exists. And my my original point was not to say that there's no commonalities. Obviously, there's base standards for everybody to achieve dignity and, and equality. Um, but we also have UNDRIP as well, which lays out another set of uh, of guidelines in terms of where we need to be. We have many. We have our own constitution. We have you know, Quebec has its human rights. Uh, um, charter as well like canada is a diverse place with like with diverse sets of understandings of what equality looks like um but the point that i think that like to me was one of the best points that i heard today and i'm totally not answering your question but i wanted to kind of just elaborate on what neil had said a little bit um is that you know and like the best anti-racist thing that you could do is look around you and see who's around you like, are there people whose voices should be included in that conversation or not? And if not, how can you individually 
one at a time, pull somebody and give them a place in that conversation. And maybe that person's not ready to take a director role like my brother Neil could, but maybe they can be in a role that their next role could be that hiring position. What is the ladder that you're responsible for? Because like all of us have access to certain degrees. So like, you know, check your access, see where you're at and see who you can pull up just one at a time. I can't tell you how many people have like been there for me throughout my career is that like, you know, here's this smart talking short guy that I think can do well. Let me just like put him into a different room and see how he does. And like the deep water, you know, I learned how to swim in deep water. And I think they were surprised that I could swim. <laughs> I was too, <laughs> but you know, I think that you never know. Um, but you got to believe that like people can do so. And just like, it's on you. It's not on us. Like, it's just on every single one of you to say, okay, here, what room do you have? And how do you, how do you extend that table? And just think of that one person, just one person who you want to pull in, just one. Yeah, that's really inspirational and some great, great uh, guidance uh, from uh, Mohammed. So we're almost out of time. And what I'd like to do is let each of the panelists uh, maybe either answer a question they feel they haven't yet answered or is in the chat that I have uh, ineptly missed as the moderator here, or their concluding thoughts on, on the topic of this panel. Um, so how would they like to go? And I think we'll go in the order that we actually started, if that's okay. So Genevieve followed by Mohammed and closing uh, Neil, because we are at uh, about five, six minutes left till the end of our session. I see many people have had to end because of their lunch break, but they can come back online and this this lecture will be online for all of our um, all of our our colleagues. So over to first of all, Genevieve. Yeah, so I'm aware that, you know, uh, people want responses and practical ideas. And so I just want to come back to uh, a comment made uh, at 1148 by a question uh, by uh, Van Hesteren. Uh, I don't know if they're still present, but uh, so basically, what do you do uh, when white people display forms of resistance to anti-racist con uh, concepts, dialogue, and work, especially in meetings and professional learning experiences? That's a really, really great question. It's great because it freaking happens so often, excuse my language, almost dropped the F-bomb. Um, it happens so much. What I would say is this, you have to, again, a lot of this comes back to where you're at personally and also how much privilege you have. So I am, again, a light-skinned racialized individual, I'm a tenured faculty member. I'm a full professor. I actually have a lot of privilege. And so at this point, and also I'm in my 50s, as I mentioned, uh, you know, at this point in time, I call people out. That's what I do. I don't take the, the BS anymore. So that's what I do. Hey, what did you mean by that? That sounds a little bit racist, dare I say. Uh, and, you know, what? Are you suggesting that racism doesn't exist? So that's kind of my style. But I think, again, Another thing I wanna just share briefly is that's my style now. Two years ago, after I finished uh, my, my stint as uh, senior advisor to the provost's office on EDI, I was shattered, exhausted because of a lot of this resistance that I was personally experiencing. And so I went into a shell and I needed to recharge. And so you really do have to take care of yourself. So take stock of, um, where you're at in your life, take stock of the personal risks you may be opening yourself up to. Um, uh, you know, if you're feeling, okay, risks are minimal, call people out. If you're feeling rather that risks are more maximal, then take a moment and be strategic, I would say. And if you have an ally in that room, uh, maybe have a private conversation with that ally to strategize a bit. Um, 
if you're a person in that room and you do have a lot of white privilege, for example, and class privilege and job privilege, and you're seeing what's going on, maybe you should step up um, and, and have a conversation. My husband, for example, again, he's a, he's a white guy, super lovely. He's also a tenured professor. He is such a great, this is a call out to white people. He's such a great ally. And we've had our fights uh, around, issue, and he's done a lot of work and a lot of learning and he uses his voice. And so, um, I don't know, just throwing that out there, a few practical things that we can be doing. Thanks, Genevieve, that was awesome. Mohammed. I kind of did my thing last time, so I'll kick it over to Neil because we got two minutes. Thank you for having me though. I was gonna say, oh yes, we're out of time, but see you next time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mohammed. I think, you know, one of the practical advice, and that's just what I, I'm a lay person, hook people up, you know, like just give them a hand up, you know, whatever language you're comfortable, learn how to be an ally. I think um, I like the, so I'll tell you one bad experience that I had at the health authority, and it's nothing specific, but I remember we were asked uh, at a group, you know, and this was shortly, there was a class action lawsuit on, you know, filed against the health authority for coerced sterilization of indigenous women and their babies, you know? So of course, when that happens, oh, all hands on deck, we got to have a conversation. We had a conversation. We, they gathered a bunch of us together and that was it, you know? And then the uh, organization had to respond and I, I respect the legal uh, responses to that type of thing. But why did you get us together? You know, and I think if you're going to, so if you're looking for practical advice, start having these conversations in your workplace and see if they're, they even exist first. And if they do exist and people are telling you that there's things that are happening, do something, like do something, you know, even just, I would have just been glad to have one more conversation after in my experience as I look back, um, just one more, you know, don't just have a conversation to have it and due diligence was done, we can move on. And then I, that's where I like evidence based because when, when we, when we started rolling, we kept having conversations. We did something. Change theory kicks in after that. You can use change management. John Cotter is good. Celebrate every single milestone, you know, so you keep that momentum going. That's what you have to do. Like, if you want practical, there's, gosh, there's smarter people than me that can tell you how do you move things, you know. But if you're going to have these conversations, then do something right after when some, if you get scared, especially, you know, do something. You know, bring in someone smarter than you. You know, it, it's actually not as bad as it seems. I do it all. I've done it my whole career. <laughs> so thank you very much. This was awesome. Thank you. So motivational. And Genevieve, the comments in the chat as well, so motivational. We are out of time. So I really want to thank our speakers today. Genevieve Fuji Johnson, Mohammed Hashim, and Neil queued up in for their insight, their observations, their lessons learned, their knowledge. It's been so insightful. If you enjoyed this lecture, please keep an eye on JSGS events calendar. We have some upcoming lectures that are really exciting. Building a child care system in Saskatchewan is going to happen on March 23rd. The power of stories, narratives, and information. Framing effects in food science with Dr. Yang Yang, March 24th. Learning from the pandemic is going to be March 30th with Dr. Catherine Smart. Uh, and if you're interested in any more of JSGS programs, uh, by all means, uh, check us out on the website. Karen uh, Jaster LaForge will post any uh, information on uh, the chat. Thank you for joining with us today. Thank you, panelists, speakers. Thank you, Karen Jaster LaForge. Awesome job, you guys. Have a great day. Take care and uh, keep in touch. <laughs>